I think um, looking at the authorization layer, certainly tokens and specifically OAuth, you know, how many of us work in environments where we're all connected in, let's say Microsoft as an example, we've got our user base that are just signing up to applications and do you want to use your Microsoft login? Yep, trust, 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 trust. And it's constantly trust this, trust this, trust this. <laughs> Cool. So when you look back over the history of privileged access management, it's very plain to see that in the 80s it grew up around controlling what somebody can do on a server. We then got into the problem of credentials, servers being built with the same static credentials over and over again, and people knowing what they were, sharing them, so you got the misuse side of things. And then as we evolved in privilege, we pushed out a bunch of agents to everything, we loaded policy on the control what everybody can do. So. Our entire life so far has been about centralizing privilege, centralizing credentials, centralizing policy, centralizing access. But if you ask any customer of a traditional PAM vendor, have they actually achieved what they set out to achieve? Pretty sure nobody could say yes. In fact, I don't think I've ever known any company that has achieved their original objectives. That's because they set out to reduce the number of privileged credentials that they've got, reduce the risk of users having static privilege. And that's what's morphing into more kind of, it's not all about users now, it's what applications have got privilege, what service accounts have privilege, etc. But does a vault actually reduce the number of credentials you've got? No, it just centralizes them. Does uh, least privileged products statically or dynamically assign privilege to people? No, it's it's a static list of you can do this. So that doesn't work in today's world where ephemeral usage is a big thing, especially with cloud, when you've got applications that talk to apps, when you've got permissions that will change if somebody's role changes, et cetera, et cetera. So access is dynamic. Privileged access management is very static. And those two things don't meet in the middle. So we've got a major problem. We can't discover privilege properly. Therefore, we don't know what we don't know. That's a risk. So, um, uh, one one note I'll offer when I when I think about privilege, um, I, I note that actually the language we use kind of shapes some of our thinking around it. Um, and so, the the word even privilege access management um, supposes uh, really two classes or two levels of users: a user without privilege and the user with privilege. Um, that framing, I think, is a bit of a, a bit of a historical uh, artifact. Um, because if you look underneath what's happening in authorization systems, uh, there's not a low state and a high state. There's a gradient of states, a whole spectrum of permissions and capabilities, right? And actually, where you should be on that spectrum at any given moment, that, that's much closer to the real problem that we're trying to solve by putting all those credentials in the jail, right? <laughs> that right. is the vault, okay? So um, so what what I, I'll just say is actually the first thing that, that, that I – uh, did when I was approaching this problem is um, to really appreciate that spectrum in all the places that it can be, N not just on the Active Directory or Windows Domain Controller, um, but uh, across really all of the workloads and all of the service types. Um, one of the observations that you very quickly make, though, is different workloads, different application types have a very different view of authorization, right? And then so you um, pretty quickly come to this uh, uh, realization that you, you need tools for managing this, uh, and those tools have to actually have the essentially full appreciation of the authorization models of the target system, but then still need to deliver uh, an end user experience that um, doesn't uh, interrupt or slow, slow down uh, the user's productivity or those use cases while still generating all of the audit and compliance uh, evidence necessary retroactively to be able to show you had controls in place. I mean, that should tell you in itself that the industry is broken. Right. And that, that we're not solving the problems that we think we're solving. This all comes down to user experience, user adoption. If the traditional tools did what they were supposed to do in an easy to use manner and solve these problems, then we wouldn't see the same repeated attacks over and over again. So I think the fact that we are seeing them shows that we need a new approach one that's far easier for users to consume, that makes them want to use these kind of privileged products. Right, right. So what are some of the things that we need to think about there so that we can do that? I think simplify the user journey. 
it, if you put privileged access management in the most simple forms, something needs to get to something securely. In order to get to something, it will need various rights to get there. So we have point A, some policy, point B. If we simplify those user journeys, you take out all the crap, for want for a better word, of you know proxies, licenses, app servers, and all this good stuff. What's the best, most secure way of me getting somewhere and getting the right level of privilege that I need? If you draw right those journeys, those journeys are quite simplistic. So if we take a step back from the technology, from all the complexity that we've built to date and think about that journey, that's a good starting point. It, it doesn't need to be more complex than that. Privileged access management is actually quite a simplistic thing when you think about it. We just make it complicated because of the history of PAM and everything that we've done to date. Yeah. Um, we, 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 we look at privileged access, but actually when you look at a modern organization, not every user is going to be a, a privileged user, right? So you don't have to manage those privileged credentials. But most users in an organization will have some kind of elevated credential to do something in an application. So, so I would say um, uh, logging you into something, um, SAML and OpenID Connect have done okay jobs uh, really standardizing how to authenticate. Um, we have achieved uh, you know, reliable single sign-on uh, right, a, a, across the industry, and that's, and that's great. Um, the next question, though, is once you've authenticated, what can you do? That's where you get into this co this continuum and this spectrum, okay? And the reason why the standards around authentication have succeeded and the standards around authorization have not yet succeeded is because authorization is just a much bigger problem, okay? It's mathematically a bigger problem. There's more to manage. There's sure. more detail. Each of these applications are completely diverse. The way you have an authorization discussion about Salesforce.com versus my Linux system versus uh, you know uh, my AWS APIs. Um, they're very very different nouns and verbs that go into those uh, into each of those, right? So the problem of creating a uniform framework for authorizing at that level of granularity it's it's just a big problem. Others have tried. Okay, um, we need to keep trying <laughs> as an industry because because it is the only path. Uh, you you have to be able to uh, in, invest in the tools, invest in the intellectual frameworks and then also build the teams around grappling with this you know messy problem like it's a it's a big messy problem uh there are tools that are going to give you leverage over that problem but you still need the commitment and a follow-through to 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 believe <laughs> that you can achieve um a level of control and visibility that you maybe haven't been able to in the past i think um looking at the authorization layer certainly tokens and specifically oauth you know how many of us work in environments where we're all connected in and let's say microsoft as an example we've got our user base that are just signing up to applications and do you want to use your microsoft login yep trust 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 and it's constantly trust this trust this trust this and that's really building a nightmare for a lot of organizations i think at the moment that's probably a bit of a hidden nightmare for them and, and you've just talked and used real life examples of where user experience have driven yes. change yeah. and behaviors. So if, if user experience is going to drive the IAM space and, and how users kind of access the resources that they need, I'm starting to think about where does the security side, how do you kind of create the security side to, to all of these things, right? Mm -hmm. That have the control, have the governance, adhere to, you know, those those regulatory musts that different people, different organizations have to adhere to. So you know, how do you create a balance between those two things? I think that's always been the job of security, right? Most people in the old days think of it as a blocker, but it really is an enablement function. I, if you're to look at the future of privileged access management as a whole, you could say privileged access management will apply to every single user within an organization because it's about access to sensitive data, not to privileged accounts or privileged servers, whatever it may be. In which case, if privileged access management became a standard that was adopted by every application, infrastructure, bit of code, whatever it was, then it should be something that everybody can interact with. And if it's a standard, it should be something users understand 
and users could configure. Because from what Amol was just talking about, you know, that user in Brazil, they'll have different privilege requirements or access requirements to what somebody in the UK, somebody in the US, somebody in Singapore will have. And they should be able to configure their own levels of privilege as long as it is compliant with the corporate policy for data retention, data storage and audit. That's really where compliance comes in. It's here's my ethical boundaries. This is how long I need to store data for. It's the guardrails that you set, and you can play within those guardrails. Right. So, so this is this is a great this is a great kind of segue into you create those guardrails. We talked a little bit in the first uh, episode around those guardrails are too static. Yeah. Right. So in this in this kind of more modern user uh, centric world, if you put those guardrails in place, how do the guardrails move and follow you in a way? that don't create friction for the user. Yeah. How, how do we create these guardrails so that they, they, they modernize, they change, they flex, right? So that user experience stays really high. Yeah, and I think that's where you kind of take the concept of things that are static and things that are dynamic and you marry them together, right? So um, we talk about it as a zero trust PAM from a strong DM perspective. And the reason why we picked zero trust was because to say, um, inherently, uh, just because you're in the right network or you're uh, logged in as somebody, you shouldn't get access, unfettered access to anything. Every action that you're about to perform should be evaluated on its own merits, right? So uh, what you need is somebody who sets the guardrails around the maximum outer limits of what you can do. And then you can shrink it any time based on what you need to do. Right. So you know that uh, based on GDPR, uh, data will not leave uh, EU if you're in the EU, right? But um, if you need to access that data to read, maybe that's okay. If you're on a corporate laptop and you're accessing the data to perform something, uh, that's okay. If you're coming from your personal machine, maybe not, that's not okay, right? Uh, if it's a machine that has been compromised because CrowdStrike or Sentinel-1 or Defender sends you a signal saying this is a compromised machine, uh, you, you, should, you shouldn't have to do anything. The system should know, well, your authorization level doesn't meet the criteria for you to access it. Right? So the system has to take these dynamic signals into account. Some of this are inherent to the connection and some of them need to be computed by uh, the policy engine mm -hmm. uh, itself. Uh, NIST has a nice framework uh, they call it PDP, policy decision point, right? You're making a you're making a decision about whether this specific action should be allowed at this specific instance in time. So there's a temporal access uh, kind of component to it. There is a what do we know about the context around which this is occurring? If it's nine to five uh, from your desk, uh, etc., that's okay. But you know sometimes you need to work from your vacation house because. You know, things don't blow up conveniently during business hours. They happen sometimes on the weekend, uh, sometimes when you're traveling, um, uh, plane trains and automobiles. You all, we all need to work from any of those locations, right? So in that account, in that, in that system, if you're able to take those signals and say, these are relevant, these are not relevant, and you can build potentially intuition, and nowadays with AI, you can do a lot of this automatically where you're... you're, you're taking that data and building models that are allow you to decide what is or is not risky. Right.